I would now like to invite Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, who is the Chief Scientist of the WHO, to deliver the introductory address to the symposium on, uh, so, uh, to, uh, to deliver the introductory address on this, to the symposium. Uh, Dr. Swaminathan was most recently WHO's Deputy Director General for Programs. He's a pediatrician and a globally recognized researcher on tuberculosis and HIV. Dr. Swaminathan was Secretary to the Government of India for Health Research and Director General of the Indian Council of Medical Research from 2015 to 2017. In that position, she focused on bringing science and evidence into health policy making, building research capacity in Indian medical schools and forging South-South partnership in health sciences. In 2021, Dr. Swaminathan was appointed as one of the members of the Pandemic Preparedness Partnership, PPP, which will advise the G7 countries on reducing the time taken to develop life-saving vaccines for new diseases. Uh, Dr. Swaminathan, uh, I would now like to invite you to deliver the introductory address to the symposium. Thank you, Kashish, and uh, good morning to everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and thanks to the organizers for uh, having invited me to what sounds like a really very interesting symposium. And I'm very happy that um, there is a debate that's going to happen on these three areas that you've identified. And as Justice uh, Bhatt was just saying, I think it's the right time um, to reflect on what needs to change in society. You know, obviously this uh, pandemic has brought about, it's not just a health emergency that we are living through, but it's also humanitarian crisis as well as an economic crisis. And one of the things it's done is exposed really the inequalities in society, whether this is in um, you know, the way that people have been impacted in different countries. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion on the ethnic minorities, for example, in the UK, in the US, uh, the black uh, and Hispanic populations in the US and the Asian um, and African populations in the UK were affected disproportionately. And um, there was a lot of discussion last year on why this was so. Um, initially, there was some hypotheses that this was genetic, underlying diseases, et cetera. Um, but compared to, say, the mortality rate in India, the mortality among the same ethnic group in, in the UK was much higher than the Caucasian. And then there was an understanding that this was um, not just uh, a biological phenomenon. It could have been that they, they have more underlying comorbidities like hypertension or diabetes, but also that they were more exposed. There were many more people on the front line from these ethnicities who were working in in um, occupations that had uh, more exposure, but also that there were the social determinants of health, which we often forget about, like um, housing and nutrition and access to health services, which played a big role in, uh, in their uh, being more susceptible to infection, more susceptible also to the complications of COVID-19. We're now entering about 18 months into the, into the pandemic. Um, the last January, we first heard about this virus on the 1st of January or the 31st of December, 2019, actually. And um, because of the very rapid sequencing of, uh, of the virus, we, uh, by 10th of January, we knew that it was a new strain of coronavirus. And in fact, that allowed um, groups around the world to start working on diagnostics and on vaccines. So one of the points I want to make is about uh, a, a new, you're, because you're going to be discussing today what changes are needed really in the ecosystem to, in three areas, you know, to promote um, health care and what do we need for universal health coverage, which includes preparedness and response to uh, emergencies and epidemics. Then around the whole um, ecosystem of R&D, focusing on clinical trials, but, you know, how do you become an innovative uh, economy, um, patents versus uh, public health or patents and, uh, and public health. Um, and then about the, uh, I would like to touch also on um, the role of science and infodemics. Uh, 
So perhaps starting with uh, with the health um, strengthening health systems aspect. <clears throat> Again, one of the things the pandemic has really brought out is clearly the, the need for strengthening uh, health systems everywhere. You know, in high income countries, middle and low income countries, universally, they were found not to be able to cope and were lacking in one aspect or another. In high, high income countries, of course, which has a lot of capacity in hospital beds, in tertiary care, they were able to provide very high quality care to people who uh, came to the hospital and who needed intensive care. But even their hospitals were being overwhelmed. Nursing and, and medical staff were getting burnt out and overwhelmed and a lot of them lost their lives uh, in the first part of the pandemic last year. But it was found that the response at the primary care level and at the public health, the surveillance um, that is needed and the immediate response in terms of the isolation, the contact tracing and the quarantining, what we call the test, track and treat isolate and quarantine, these were only done well in a handful of countries. And these were mostly low-income countries like Vietnam and Cambodia and some middle-income countries like Thailand, which has over years invested in their primary healthcare system and in their public healthcare system. So even though they did not have access to high tech, there was at a point when a lot of countries believed that apps would solve the problem of contact tracing and then soon to realize that digital tools do not solve the problem for you. Technology cannot solve a problem, it can only assist in solving the problem. You can use it as a, as a tool, but by itself technology obviously cannot, and that's obvious, but still there was so much hope in these apps, apart from all the other questions that came up around privacy, that was being collected and this was differently in different countries. In some countries, um, the, the state actually has complete access to all personal information and can use it in whatever way you know, that they want. But in other countries, particularly in, in vibrant democracies, this is really difficult. And the, the government really has to have clear cut guidelines and guardrails around how the, the data is going to be used. But talking about data, what was, is going to be critical in the future is early access to data, uh, whether it is data on you know, identifying a new um, uh, cluster of cases, which is interesting, you know, possibly be a new pathogen, um, whether it's around genome sequence data, whether it's access to the samples. In case, let's say there's a new uh, outbreak with an unknown pathogen occurring in a country which doesn't have any of the resources to identify it, one would need access to the samples right away so they could be taken to a lab outside uh, the country for swift identification. So this is why you know, we've, we have all of these reviews going on now around the international health uh, regulations, just as Matt mentioned, international health regulations were last updated in 2005, but clearly there have been uh, big gaps in the way that these are implemented. I think it's not the rules, it's the implementation of the rules and the willingness of countries to be very uh, open and uh, forthright about their data. So, so the International Health Com uh, Regulations Review Committee has uh, taken a fresh look and suggested uh, modifications. Again, as I said, it's mostly around implementation, accountability, and um, mutual uh, accountability and transparency. So all countries would need to commit, and perhaps we need a legal framework, uh, which uh, even though the IHR is supposed to be uh, a sort of a legal framework, there is no um, enforcement mechanism. WHO does not have uh, the mandate or the powers to enforce this. So it's, it's still voluntary. Um, so that's something that, that we need to look at. Data sharing, again, for samples, we've, we've set up what we call the bio hub in Switzerland with the idea that there would be more hubs around the world through our network of collaborating centers. For influenza, there's been an excellent system now operating for over 60 years with a network of 120 or more labs uh, around the world, which uh, regularly share data on influenza, because as you know, influenza, one of the viruses that circulates around the world keeps on changing uh, or mutating and needs a new strain selection every year for vaccine. And that can only be done if people are sharing the data. And then there's a central committee at the WHO that looks at 
makes a recommendation. So again, we may end up in that situation with COVID as well. We're setting up now the mechanism and the framework to do the risk assessment and management. You've all heard about these variants that are uh, being described, the latest one, of course, from India, the B1617 variant, which could be classified as a variant of concern. The WHO committee is looking at this now. Currently, there are three global variants of concern, the ones identified in the UK, the B117, the B1351 from South Africa, and the B1, B1 from Brazil. And we don't like to call these by the name of the country because you know, that stigmatizes, um, stigmatizes the country and, in fact, is a deterrent to countries actually being more open with their data. So it might have originated or been originally described by a country, but all of these variants spread very quickly. They really don't respect any national boundaries. So what's important is what impact are they having on transmission, on clinical severity, on impact of vaccines. And these are the three parameters we look at before we say that you know, something is a variant of concern. So I think we have to be prepared. Um, looking at where the world is now, looking at the situation of vaccines, the complete mismatch between supply and demand, it, uh, we need to be prepared for, for the pandemic uh, really not to come to an end, much as we would all like it to come to an end, unless we are able to work in global solidarity and ensure that there is equity in the distribution of health products, which is related to the topic that you're going to discuss on the clinical trial regulatory uh, framework. I think India needs to really look at its institutions very carefully and closely, see how they perform during the pandemic and what, you know, the, the, the clinical trial regulatory system has uh, undergone a lot of ups and downs. And if India is going to be an innovation powerhouse, if we're going to, as we see today, there are many innovative vaccines that are in, in development in several Indian labs and companies, not just, you know, contract basis or, or doing generics, but really producing innovative products, we need to look very carefully at the, uh, the system that operates both globally and nationally uh, and how we're going to fit in as part of that. So the, the Drug Controllers General Office is, is very critical and some of these key positions really need to be at a very high level and independent um, of uh, you know, all uh, political and other kinds of influence. So if you look at you know, the chief public health officer of the country, the, the chief drug regulator of the country, like the FDA commissioner, the, the head of the NIH, which is the head of the uh, research body in, in India, it's the ICMR, all need to be very senior, technically very, very highly skilled and well uh, respected people who are independent, whose, whose uh, uh, voice and decision making is completely independent. So. The R&D has been discussed a lot in the pandemic uh, preparedness framework as to how we can improve that. You know, we need to invest in clinical research in, in our country and in many countries around the world. Our medical schools hardly produce any research output, let alone high quality clinical trials, except for a handful of uh, medical schools. You can count probably on one hand. So strengthening the clinical research ecosystem, strengthening regulatory ecosystem, we have a good manufacturing ecosystem. So that's not a problem, but you know, the quality assurance is really uh, critical, which needs to be maintained. So I think there's, there's a lot that can be done, but there's also a good base uh, to build on. We, but we have to focus on that. And then um, on science and the role that science has played. I mean, I think it's become very clear that the, you know, the solutions to the pandemic have come from science and have come because of the sustained investment in science uh, around the world, uh, you know, these mRNA platforms, there have been scientists working on them for over 30 years when nobody ever thought that mRNA could possibly ever be uh, a vaccine uh, type of platform. But it did happen and it happened because the mRNA was being used for developing vaccines against other coronaviruses, against Zika, et cetera. And so these scientific labs were able to very quickly pivot as soon as they got the genetic sequence of this virus, took the spike protein uh, and put it into this platform, whether it's the adenovirus platform like the Oxford one, or whether it, it was the mRNA, the, the BioNTech, the German company that was set up by the two uh, Turkish, uh, the Turkish couple in Germany, or whether it was Moderna. Moderna, a lot of its know-how comes 
from many years of NIH funding and investment. So again, it has to be public funding. Some of it could be private investment, but sustained public funding is needed in R&D to keep on advancing the scientific, uh, the horizon. Uh, you keep moving the technology uh, and then you quickly use it when there is a need. So again, investment in our science and scientific institutions, R&D institutions, um, and really not looking for immediate or quick returns um, is going to be critical. And as I said, we have the know-how and the capacity to develop things which are affordable and scalable. So that's a big advantage, but you know, the right incentives need to be in place. And then how do you develop these goods for public good? Um, that's the big uh, debate now about you know, the, uh, the patent waiver and, and so on. When is something a public good? I mean, you can argue that all vaccines are public goods, that many drugs which are life-saving are global public goods. And if there's been a significant investment from the public sector, from taxpayer money, from philanthropy, then there should be some rules around how the private sector actually wants it's you can't develop it without the private sector. You can't scale it up. So you need that partnership with the private sector. But how do you incentivize them then to make it accessible and affordable? And um, the COVAX facility that you know, I've been very closely working on was set up because we recognize that in the past, the, the world has not delivered on equity. Uh, whether you take the H1N1 pandemic or you take HIV, or hepatitis B or any uh, big public health disease. It's taken decades for an innovation to get from the high income to low income countries. So the COVAX facility was set up uh, and the whole ACT Accelerator was set up basically to, uh, for two things. One is to accelerate R&D for new diagnostics, therapeutics and vaccines. And the second was to ensure equitable by pool procurement, by you know, distributing the risk, by investing in many different candidates and ensuring that there were volumes that were uh, committed. And we did all of that, but there was a shortage of funds in 2020. And the big companies that developed the vaccines made huge contracts with countries that were able to pay them billions of dollars in advance. And India actually stepped up. So the Serum Institute of India was the main supplier for COVAX for two of its vaccines, both the Oxford AstraZeneca and the Novavax vaccine. But now that supplies have been diverted for domestic use, understandably because of the situation in India, the COVAX facility is really left struggling with very little supplies coming in and having to depend now on uh, other uh, companies coming up or from uh, donations or sharing of doses from those rich countries that actually have uh, a lot of extra uh, supplies. So that's not a very good situation to be in. And again, there will be lessons learned from how the world needs to come together and act. You know, It's not enough to just promote the science and get the tools. We then need to use those solutions uh, in, an, in an equitable manner. And um, this is, again, something which needs to be discussed at the global uh, level, because in a pandemic, a country by country solution is not the, uh, going to be the answer. Uh, but the same thing could apply if there is an outbreak within a country or within a region. So we had Nipah, for example, which occurs in the Southeast Asian region. And um, at that time in 2018, 17 and 18, we did a lot of thinking on how can we network across Southeast Asia, both uh, the scientists, uh, but also finding, you know, there was monoclonal antibody developed by lab in Australia. So we said, let's bring that into India and store it there, have the clinical trial protocol ready to go have the ethics approval, the regulatory approval and everything done so that when the first case of Nipah is detected, the, within hours, the monoclonal antibody could be injected into the patient you know, to, in an effort, because as you know, the mortality is very high with Nipah. So those kinds of preparatory activities, you know, the, the ethics committees in some countries took 48 hours to turn around a protocol like the Solidarity Global Therapeutics Trial that you know, we were running last year. And some countries took six months to look at the protocol. So again, preparing yourself to respond to emergencies, it's not just one uh, arm of, of the health system, it's all arms of the health system you know, that need to be prepared. I haven't said a lot about surveillance and so on because again, we see now the big gaps in, in surveillance, in detection, in response and in prevention. 
we, we enter into what is called the cycles of panic and neglect, where we go through um, you know, huge panic as we're going through now. And then I hope that a few months from today, we don't go back into the period of neglect where we think everybody, everything is done and dusted and uh, you know, we can all go back to life as normal. So I think a lot of us are hoping that life as normal is not life as normal, which means pre-pandemic. It's a new uh, normal, whether it's more environmentally sustainable, you know, climate friendly. We need to think about the other big threats like antimicrobial resistance. There's so much of antibiotic misuse now, even though COVID-19 is a viral infection. Every patient that I know of in India has been prescribed a couple of antibiotics, not just one but several antibiotics, corticosteroids, and all kinds of things, which is really going to lead to an increase in antimicrobial resistance. So climate change, antimicrobial resistance are not going anywhere. Zoonotic diseases and pandemics are going to happen in the future. This is certainly not the last one, even though right now we feel like this is a nightmare we want to come out of. But if you look at the timeline of pandemics, the gap between pandemics is only getting shorter. Some are easier to handle, some are not so virulent, but you could have a pathogen which has a much higher case fatality rate than SARS-CoV-2, and that would be even more catastrophic than what we are seeing today. So the preparedness detection response system in all countries, including India, really needs to be looked at. And finally, before I end, I want to say a word about the infodemics and the social and behavioral sciences. We often pay a lot of attention to biomedical research, particularly today when we talk about vaccines and drugs, but behavior change and the influence of behavioral insights and behavioral sciences on public health programs cannot be uh, overestimated. Um, it is uh, absolutely true that behavior change does not occur just by knowledge or information. Uh, it's a very different um, set of uh, actions which occurs in order to, I mean, if they uh, every smoker has seen uh, warnings uh, on the packs and knows that it's harmful to health and that you could get cancer and all kinds of other diseases. That doesn't really help them to quit. So, so we need to keep that in mind. And we've seen the misinformation campaigns, the conspiracy theories, the social media being used, you know, really by anti-vaxxers and anti-science movements, which uh, were to me really very surprising and shocking how they can really question uh, and sow the seeds of doubt in people's minds, you know, about things which you would think are pure common sense. And so this whole discipline of infodemics that we coined, you know, way back, uh, and the DG, in fact, Dr. Tedros used to say that on the one hand, you have the pandemic, but you have an equally dangerous infodemic, which needs to be handled. So again, health literacy, scientific literacy, um, public literacy, children, school children, we have to start with school children really learning uh, about uh, scientific principles. They don't all have to become scientists, but you need to apply some rationality and scientific thought in your day-to-day -day and, and question things which sound bizarre uh, or could be untrue. So, so that is again uh, something that while science is, needs to be celebrated, we have to remember that there are these, uh, fringe, well, they're not really fringe anymore. I think they're pretty much in the mainstream and spreading all these conspiracy theories uh, about vaccines uh, and uh, creating a lot of vaccine hesitancy around the world. And again, it's not related to education levels. The highest levels of vaccine hesitancy are in Europe and countries like France. So um, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's you know, something to do with your, with your belief system, really. So, um, so again, that's another challenge uh, ahead for us in India, especially since we have such a huge population that's you know, not um, health literate or scientifically literate. So perhaps I will uh, end there. I know that uh, I've gone over the time, but uh, it was a great pleasure to talk to you all. And I really look forward to hearing um, the outputs of, of this meeting, this very interesting discussion that you're going to have today. Kashish, back to you. Thank you very Thank much. You so so we will be taking over now. Thank you very much, Dr. Swaminathan. You have rightly contextualized the symposium by pointing out the different kinds of inequities that characterize the pandemic. Your emphasis on strengthening global health systems is well noted. 
You have also given very relevant overview of the holistic response the pandemic demands, along with locating the health crisis in the global institutional information and regulatory frameworks. We are very grateful to you.